Hey everyone, hope we're all good. Um, this episode is a recap and a summary of the England versus New Zealand uh, rugby international that was at Twickenham yesterday. Uh, always a massive occasion in the world of rugby when England and the All Blacks get it on. It doesn't happen regularly enough, um, so when it does, uh, it's a big deal. Full house at Twickenham yesterday, and it was a good precursor to see where England are at under Eddie Jones with the World Cup in France next year sort of on the horizon. Um, coming into the game, there was quite a lot of discord about Eddie Jones, his management of the England team, what is the style, what sort of the playing philosophy going to be in terms of personnel and the type of rugby that he wants to play going into the tournament. England played Argentina, of course, very recently and lost. Only the second time they've lost to the Pumas at home. So not the greatest form going into uh, a match against the All Blacks. Now the All Blacks came out midweek. They're always up for playing uh, at Twickenham. Aaron Smith, the um, the scrum half, said it's one of the biggest challenges and one of the, the biggest sort of pick-me-ups that the, the All Blacks look forward to any time they take on England at Twickenham. And so it proved they clearly had done their homework. They knew England's weaknesses and they knew how to exploit them. There's a couple of things that you get with the All Blacks before you even start. That is intensity, intensity with the ball, intensity without the ball. The way that they go into the tackle, the way they compete at the breakdown, the way that they will run with ball in hand. They are, a, not only are they a powerhouse, nobody plays the game of rugby like the All Blacks. The second thing that you know that they're gonna have is hand speed, the ability to pass the ball, the offloads, the, the passing either into open space or on the blind side. Always options, always players looking to make runs, even those in the pack, hookers and props with single hand offloads mid tackle. You just don't see that from anyone else. So you know that from the very first second, from the first kickoff, the All Blacks are going to be at it. They're going to be running hard. They're going to be running fast. A lot of ball in hand. They're going to put you under incredible pressure. If you get the ball, uh, if you achieve a turnover or you're looking to put a bit of pressure onto them, they will compete at the breakdown. Their defence is ferocious. One thing that you need to be doing against the All Blacks is from the very first second to the very last is you need to have concentration, you need to have intensity. England in that first half were appalling, absolutely terrible. Don't know what style of rugby they were looking to play, don't know what brand of rugby they were looking to play. England historically are a forward-based team and very much about the pack, very much looking to dominate set plays. Uh, they'll do a lot of kicking as well. They're not renowned for playing fast, aggressive, attacking rugby with the ball in hand. It's something that is being in the process of changing for the last few years, but we didn't see any of that in the opening in the opening period. Some very, very basic mistakes. Lack of communication. Lack of awareness. Lack of taking ownership. Um, don't know what type of game they were looking to play positionally or tactically. Really felt sorry for England scrum half Jack Van Paul felt he had a poor game. Three minutes in, England line out, England win the line out, looking to build, looking to go through the phases. Uh, and he throws a pass, didn't look at all before he threw it, didn't gauge his surroundings, didn't look at what was going on. It was in the second or the third mini phase from the line out, once it had been competed and won and knocked back. Um, the defensive side can be as aggressive as they want. They can break the lines. They can look to attack, which is what New Zealand did. And he threw effectively a blind pass. And I think it was the flanker, then number seven from uh, from New Zealand, read what he was going to do, ran straight onto the pass and was able to run through the 22 unchallenged try within three and a half minutes. It's basic mistakes. England had done the first couple of phases brilliantly. The good throw, won the line out, had recycled the ball, were ready to start going through the phases. They could start to build up some momentum. New Zealand were on the right-hand side of the pitch because of the line-out, and you, you could have overloads ready to run the ball down the field, put their defence under a bit of pressure, start the game in a good in a good vein. No, didn't look, didn't gauge the surroundings, didn't see what was going on, just threw a, a you know a blind pass, and that set the precedent. Um, England didn't recover from that. It was a hammer blow. They were under immense pressure, certainly for the first 20, 25 minutes. So the first, you know, solid quarter of the game, New Zealand could have scored three tries. They did score a second try through a well-worked um, uh, pack set play. And had it not been for a sort of a grab round the neck of Owen Farrell, which 
if you're playing sort of Super 14 rugby, you can get away with that. Perhaps in the Northern Hemisphere, you don't. England got away with one, but they could have been three tries down within 25 minutes. As it was, it was just two tries. They just couldn't get any momentum. Um, they were looking they were looking towards Marcus Smith, who's inexperienced. I think he's got 13 caps. He is the next big hope in terms of playing fly half, um, or second 5'8", as it's called in the South, Southern Hemisphere. Wonderful talent. He's kind of got that enigmatic, you don't know what you, he's going to get kind of play. It's something that uh, Cipriani had from a few years ago. Um, it's something that the best fly halves have got. They've got that ability to conjure something out of nowhere. I think he's actually inhibited by playing alongside Farrell at 12, who he's a very dogged servant. He's played for England and he's served England very, very well. Amazing kicker. Solid in defence. Yes, he can he can kick the ball if you want to play a kicking game, but with uh, ball in hand, doesn't offer you an awful lot. And I think having now surpassed 100 caps, there's a shadow, which I think he casts over anyone who plays 10. And I think it impacted Ford when Farrell and Ford played together. And I think it's impacted Marcus Smith a little bit. Marcus definitely played within himself, didn't play as free or expansive or as assertively or take control uh, as he does when he plays um, Premiership rugby. Um, I think the whole team struggled uh, in that first half. Um, they definitely needed Eddie Jones and the coaching team to get into them, lay into them a little bit. When they go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, when they look to play, they can hurt New Zealand. But if you're going to make silly mistakes, if you're not going to communicate, if you're not going to have basic spatial awareness, pff, the one team you don't want to be doing that against is New Zealand. Um, so they go into the half 17-6 down. Um, it could have been worse, as I say. Had they had a converted try, it could have been 24-6. Um, didn't start the second half particularly well at all. Again, some handling errors. Um England have been guilty when they're looking to play through the phases of just not being attentive enough, basic attention to detail. They can play well with the ball in hand, not too dissimilarly to Ireland, but the difference is Ireland do the basics well. They don't make many handling mistakes, very disciplined. They don't go offside, forward passes. You can't give a team like New Zealand a sniff. And what New Zealand did very, very well is because they've got pace on their wing. They've got a uh, tall, rangy, uh, players, very strong wingers, they were doing a lot of crossfield kicks. They were doing a lot of 30, 40, 50 yard crossfield kicks to exploit the pace. And England were nervous under the high ball. They were drawn towards the ball to where the action was, leaving great space. And sort of 48, 49 minutes into the match, so eight, nine minutes after half time, exactly that. You know, they, they, they ping a ball from right to left. England's right side defence, nowhere to be seen. And the, um, the, 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 the Kiwi winger, he, he ran onto the ball when he runs 60 yards. I mean, bear in mind, this is a guy who runs 100 metres in 10-6. So you're not going to catch him. But it was the fact that no one had the presence of mind from an, in an England shirt to spot the danger, to fill in any pockets of space. It wasn't the first time that they'd been crossfield kicks. It was a tactic New Zealand exploited multiple times through the game. A naivety that they didn't pick up on it once or twice. That it continued to happen through the game. And if that happens in a World Cup, England are in major trouble. And all of a sudden, England are 22-6 down. Um, they tried to make more of a fist of it, tried to compete physically. Uh, Barrett scored an incredible drop goal. Got to give him credit, with, you know, in that fullback position where he can see the game. Um, I think it was like a 25-metre drop goal. 25-6, you think England are dead and buried. Credit to England and credit to Eddie Jones. He made some, some changes. Uh, he introduced and injected a little bit of pace and directness in the England attack, um, made some changes in centre, and brought on um, Young's a scrum half, who was suddenly playing quicker ball um, without the sort of the, the passing mistakes that we'd seen in the first half. And suddenly England looked a threat. They put New Zealand on the back foot. That injection of of pace, those fresh legs seem to have more of an effect than the All Black substitutions. And 15, 20 minutes to go, England started putting New Zealand on the back foot. Um, 70, 71 minutes on the clock, England scored a try through, again, forward play, which is what I said earlier, England are renowned for their forward play. Uh, and they managed to get Barrett sinned bin for the last 10 minutes. So New Zealand down to 14 men. 
uh, England very quickly were able to recycle and maintain that um, offensive pressure from all the restarts. Suddenly they scored a couple of tries and you're thinking they possibly couldn't. Well, they only bloody did. With two minutes to go, England scored again. And all of a sudden, it's 25-25. One of the most amazing comebacks in a game of rugby I've ever seen in my life. Not just because of how quickly they scored in in such a short space of time, seven minutes, and they scored 19 points, but the fact that it's against the All Blacks. Now, I'm of the opinion that the All Blacks, at this point in time, are not a classic, um, all-time great team. I don't think Barrett is as good as people make out. I don't think he's as good as Dan Carter, simple as that. Smith is a solid, solid scrum half, uh, but they're missing the likes of McCaw. Um, they're missing sort of like somebody like a Julian Surveyor or a Rocco Coco. Um, he was the closest they ever got to replacing the great Jonah Lomu. Um, but you could go through, you could talk about Jerry Collins, Mia Lamu. They've had some wonderful players. And the team of uh, 2011, 2015, that was an amazing all black side. This one, I don't think, hits those standards. When they turn it on, they probably still are the most ferocious team around. Definitely a semi-finalist in a World Cup. Ireland's mental block, which I think they have in, in tournaments, um, means that if they were to come up against them, you'd fancy them to beat Ireland. Um, but if they were to come up against South Africa, you never know. Um, of course, they came up against England in the last World Cup and lost in the semi-final. Um but if they turn it on, they'll give anyone a game and you'd probably put them down as favourites in any match. But I don't, I don't think they're that great a side. And I think had England started that the game the way that they finished it, with the intensity and with the pace and with Marcus Smith dictating the game, I think England could have won that match. And I think... it. it I'm, I, I come away from Twickenham and I'm frustrated that if England go on the offensive, much like the Football World Cup. Take the shackles off. Release the handbrake. The team is a far better unit going forward with ball in hand as opposed to where they were a few years ago, which was very much a kick for a kick for territory type team and a forward focused side. They'll always compete at the breakdown. They'll always compete in scrums and at lineouts, rucks, malls. It's part of England's DNA. But the last ten years or so England have made a, a big focus on a running game, a ball-in-hand game, being able to compete with the best in the world when it comes to offloads. We saw when Curry and Underhill were, were playing together in the World Cup semi-final, the intensity that they played from the very first kick. England do that every week. They will match any side in the world, but they don't. And what we've seen in the three years since the last World Cup has been stagnation and possibly even a bit of regression. We we were potentially burnt out in the World Cup final against South Africa. And they were also a little bit wily for us. They played the game very, very well. Very cute game management. England didn't quite have that. And it was almost like they'd reached their zenith in the semi-final. Fine. You take it, you learn from it, and you, you build. And that World Cup semi-final performance, one of the best performances England have ever put in in a World Cup, period. That was the blueprint. That blueprint has not been followed. This was the perfect match to let the young Lions off the leash and let them go. And they didn't. Now, whether that's Eddie Jones, possibly, based on the team that he selected, or whether that's the players, maybe the pressure, maybe they were they were trying to, to book their place and cement their place in the starting 15. Um, possibly a combination of the both. But the way they finished the match surely has to be the blueprint that England use moving forward what was equally frustrating was when we got into overtime when the 80 minutes were up England had the ball in hand yes they were sort of on the edge of their own 22 but New Zealand were rattled they were they were ragged they were tired you've got a man advantage why not take the ball in hand and run go through the phases you could win the game you could get a penalty um, you may get an overload you may score uh, a match winning try they were there for the taking New Zealand. And this is where I think Eddie Jones's um, management has sort of taken over with a real tight iron grip. Marcus Smith, who I said earlier, could be a match winner, 
could be a world beater at number 10. He put a dead kick out just so that the game would end. That's something I expect from somebody like Farrell. You lick your wounds, take the draw, move on. This, this is an England side that needs to be looking to play aggressive ball in hand rugby. That is why Marcus Smith is in the team. This should be an era to usher in a new style of play, a new set of players, put competition um, in your backs and up front where hand skills are just as important or more important than just brute force. And we reverted to type. We started the game at type and we finished the game at type. And I just, it, it frustrated me. The lot, you'd had a 10 minute period where you blitz the All Blacks. Go at them. Try and win the game. If it goes dead, it goes dead. But it was almost defeatist. And I've come away from that from that game very similarly, actually, to when England played Germany a few months ago at Wembley and it finished 3-3. Great swathes of the game, England were outplayed by the Germans. But there was a period right at the end where, from being 2-1 down, they went 3-2 up and should have won the game. Eventually, it finished 3-3. Yes, it showed that England, pound for pound or man for man, aren't quite at the top. But when England apply themselves and play to their strengths, they'll give anyone a game, they'll compete with anyone, and they can hurt anyone. And that is exactly what they did against New Zealand for pockets before they started scoring. They put the All Blacks on the back foot. When they played aggressive attacking rugby, the All Blacks were struggling. And then they started that scoring spree in the last 10 minutes, which I think they should have just gone out on their shield and gone for the win. I almost hope that Eddie Jones leaves after this World Cup. And I hope that we have a building block of attack-orientated and attack-minded players that we will focus on and work with whatever happens in this World Cup. Because I think we've got a generation that could really do something in a mould, in a style of the All Blacks, rather than the, um, the Dad's Army style that we've been sort of brushed with or tainted with in the past. Anyway, if anyone was at the game, let me know. Uh, if anyone agrees or disagrees with my assessment, let me know. Um, any time you don't lose the All Blacks is fine, but I think they were there for the taking. I think we could have beaten them. And that's why I just feel a little bit... Uh, although I'm encouraged with that last 10-minute performance, the 70 minutes around that is um, what has concerned me. And it's a case of what might have been rather than um, accomplishment. Anyway, stay tuned for the next episode coming your way soon. Mm -hmm.